All right. Brother Steve Thren is going to be preaching for us this afternoon. Be a blessing. So whenever you're ready, brother. Come on Well, good afternoon. I uh, I'm going to move this until <laughs> Brother Cobb is not here. I will move it. Um, this is a special time for me. It may very well be the last time I ever stand in this pulpit. And uh, I remember the first time I stood here, eight years ago. And uh, I probably, other than the church I pastored in Indiana, I probably have preached in this pulpit more than any other pulpit in my life. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an emotional time for me. Uh, and uh, when we came here, I didn't plan on leaving. I planned on dying here. Um, but uh, as we heard this morning, our plans aren't always the Lord's plans. And uh, so it's best just to do what the Lord wants. And... Uh, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to my wife's favorite New Testament book, and that's the book of John, chapter number 5. I do plan on coming back in April, if, uh, if it's the Lord's will. I want to be here for that whole meeting in April, all two weeks of it, and... Uh, and I got a son in Canada that I have not seen in three years, at least three years, four years. And, well, I guess I have seen him. We saw him across the border. We met up in Timbuktu up there somewhere. And they were standing in Canada, and we were six feet away in the United States. And... Uh, I don't like those kind of meetings. Well, I, I did appreciate it, but I want to touch them. I want to hug them. Yep. And I'm, uh, I'm different from all the rest of my family. Uh, my family that preceded me, the family I came from. I kiss them all. The big ones, the little ones, the in-between ones. And uh, I'm looking forward to that day that I can do it again. Amen. But in John chapter number 5, uh, the Lord meets up with his uh, self-proclaimed enemies once again. Uh, he, he don't count them as enemies, or he did count them as enemies, but they counted him as an enemy. They wanted to kill him. And we'll see that again here in chapter number five. I don't know about you, but I don't understand 
people very well. I don't understand why they couldn't do what he suggested and search the scriptures. I don't understand why they couldn't simply ask him. You know, they, uh, they got together one day and, and they were having their little meeting. Uh, they were probably, it was probably a, a, a pastor's fellowship is probably what it was. And, uh, or the priest fellowship, whatever you want to call them. And they said, uh, there's no prophet come out of Galilee. No prophet come out of Nazareth. You know what? All they had to do was ask him where he was born. He'd have told them. He was born in Bethlehem. And that's what the Bible said that he would be. Yeah. That's what the Old Testament scripture said. So why couldn't they do that? And I, I am confused about the people of today. This right here. It's either God's word or it's not. There's, there's nothing in between. It's either true or it's not true. There's nothing in between. And uh, I read a book. Uh, I think it was called The Case for Christ. It was written by Lee Strobel, I believe his name is. And he was a heathen. And somebody challenged him to read the book. And he did. And he was going to prove it wrong. But it proved him lost. Yep. It proved him lost. And as far as I know, he got saved. He wrote a book about it called The Case for Christ. I believe that's what the name of it was. And I don't understand people today why they object to us telling other people about Christ. Why do they object to that? It's no, as we used to say in school, it's no skin off their nose. Right. You know, if we tell other people about Christ. And I, I have a hard time understanding those that uh, object to that. But we know the whole world is that way. Our government is against it. And uh, if, you, if you try and pin them down, they'll say, oh yeah, I know God. Uh-huh. Sure you do. But this is a book I believe. This book I've been believing for over 50 years now, 51 years. And it was through the pages of this book, the Word of God, that I got saved. And uh, this afternoon, I'm going to... Uh, we're going to look at uh, chapter number five. We're actually we're going to look at the whole chapter, but I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Um, but uh, it starts. Uh, let's uh, let me. I'll just read some scripture, and if you want to call that my text, you can. Uh, I, the whole chapter number five is my text. So look, look with me in uh, chapter number 5, verse number 14. It says, Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come up, uh, unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. 
Let us pray. Thank you again, Father, for the opportunity that I have this afternoon to open the Word of God and to convey what you have showed me in these verses. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that still has questions in their minds about Jesus, that this would clear them up. Lord, I am 76 years old, and I'm still amazed at how many people, once they have heard the truth, can disregard it. And Father, I, ha- I pray that uh, this afternoon you'd help me to uh, convey the truth. And Lord, to give us ammunition in our, our quest to serve you by sharing the gospel with others. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The story, and I use that word story because it is a story, but the stories in the Bible are not fiction, they're truth. And Jesus has gone to the feast, and uh, he's at Jerusalem, and he's by this pool of Bethesda, And uh, one time a year, this angel came down and troubled the waters, and whoever first got into the pool was cured of any ailment that they had. And Jesus saw this one man laying there. He had been there for 38 years, or he had to, I don't know how long he'd been laying there, but he had this ailment for 38 years. A long time to be sick. Mm -hmm. And Jesus asked him if he wanted to be healed. And uh, the man said, how can I? There's no one here to help me. He said, every time the waters are stirred, as I'm going down, someone gets there before me. And it was because of his ailment that he couldn't get down there. But Jesus said... Rise up and walk. Take up thy bed. And he did. And uh, our son, our son David wrote a song. It's called He Made Me Whole. And that's the only way Jesus heals. He does it all the way. He makes them whole. So the man is, he took up his bed and he's, he's walking there he's going, and uh, the Jews, of course, they uh, say, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath day. And, and uh, he said, well, this man healed me and told me to rise up and walk. And so, And they asked him who it was, and he said he didn't know because Jesus didn't hang around. He just kept moving on. And so later on, Jesus finds him and reveals to to him who he is. And so they go back. Where we read in the scripture, the man goes back, and he went to the Jews and told them it was Jesus. Now here's here's the thing. Why weren't they excited that somebody got healed? Every time Jesus did a miracle, he made people mad. The Jews, the chief priests and the scribes and Pharisees, the Sadducees, I always wondered, uh, little rabbit trail, why did they call them Sadducees? I was going to look that up and find out where it came came from, 
but I think I figured it out without even looking it up. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in angels. So they were sad, you see. That's what I figured out. But, but Jesus had performed a miracle. He, he cured a man been ill for 38 years. Nobody else had a cure. But because he did it on the Sabbath day, the Jews got angry with him, the leaders. And it says in verse number 16, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. That was not the only reason. It wasn't just because he did it on the Sabbath day. But Jesus had a, had a history of doing things on the Sabbath day. And uh, a lot of, you read about a lot of the miracles and uh, raising from the dead and all this, a lot of it happened on the Sabbath day. The man with the withered hand. And uh, I, that, I guess this is another thing that confuses me. I guess I'm just too simple. I don't understand these things. Uh, what kind of work did he do that he healed the man? He just said, you're healed. Yeah. Is that work? It, even if God did it, it wouldn't be work to him. I mean... Anything that he did, if he reached out and took his hand, or whatever, however he did it, but he just spoke the word. But I guess I'm just simple. I guess I just can't understand the workings of the minds of people that hate God. I want to give you four witnesses that they should have understood, that they should have grasped if they were really searching for God, mm -hmm. which they were not. Amen. You know what they were worried about? Their position, yep. their power. That's what they were afraid of. Who is this man? I mean, he's not like us. He's, he's not seeking for position. He's not seeking for power. He just wants to help people. He's not like us. So we can't have him. We can't have all the people following him. If they follow him, what's going to happen to us? You remember when Paul went to Corinth and uh, he got quite a following. Said the next day or the next Sabbath day, almost the whole city was there. And what did it say about the Jews? They were jealous. They were jealous. They didn't want to lose their place. Turn with me to the, uh, the end of John. I had to turn a page. Maybe you don't even have to turn a page, but I had to. Verse number 42. Jesus is talking now to the Pharisees and the scribes and whoever, he said, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Wow, what a statement. Mm -hmm. I can see why they were a little upset. Mm -hmm. He made statements like this before. 
They didn't like them questioning their, their place with God. You ever ask somebody to give you their testimony and they respond with, you don't think I'm saved? No. <laughs> no, I don't. Not if, you're, not if you're get offended because I ask you if you are. And most people that are saved, they're glad to tell you, yes, I'm saved. And let me tell you about it. But he said, I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Isn't that amazing? Somebody else came and uh, put on a good show, you know, and had a, had a little bit of a following. Isn't it amazing how big people can build a church that doesn't even know God? All they got to do is have the right promotion, the right charisma. Verse 44, how can ye believe... When, how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, to whom, in whom ye trust. Wow. <laughs> Moses. Moses was the one that wrote the, the Pentateuch. I mean, the, the five major Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He wrote all those. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Mm -hmm. But if ye believe not his writings... How shall ye believe my words? Witness number one. The witness of the writings. Jesus said in verse number 39, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Search the scriptures. The witness of the writings. People who will say, I just can't believe that, they need to read the book. When I, was, uh, when I got saved, I was 24, and... Uh, um, almost 25 when I got saved. And I got me a little Bible. It was only yay by yay. It was blue plastic cover on it. I don't even know if you can still buy them. And it was real small, but that was when I had good eyes and I could read. And I took that Bible to work with me. I worked for... Uh, General Motors in Lansing, Michigan, at the Oldsmobile plant. That tells you how long ago. They don't even make Oldsmobiles anymore. And I worked on the engine line. And uh, I, I put heads on one side of the engine and bolted it down. And I had to do one every 18 seconds. You said, wow, that's pretty fast. Well... When you got good at it, I could work about six engines ahead. And I'd work six, in, six engines ahead, and I'd get out that little Bible and I'd read. And when the other one got up there, I'd do it again. And I don't know how long it took me, but I read the whole Bible. Not at work. I mean, I took it home with me, too. But I read the whole Bible, and you know what? I, I didn't know any more uh, before I read it than I did after I read it. Um, but, you know, 
it, it, there was something that I knew that I had to have and I knew it was in that book. I knew it was in that book. I wanted to learn about the God that would save me. Because I knew me. I knew what I was. I knew what I had been. And I wondered, why would God love me enough to go to the cross for me? And uh, I've been reading the Bible ever since. 50, it'll be 52 years in May of, it'll be 53 years. Oh, I've been saved longer than I thought I had, but 53 years in May of next year. And uh, I still haven't grasped everything that's in it, and I never will. I never will. But what God has put in the Old Testament scriptures, it tells his story. It tells the story of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6, it tells of his birth, his coming. Unto us a child is born. It tells of his coming. Why didn't they see that? In Isaiah chapter 52, the last three verses in all the chapter 53, it tells of his death for us. Why didn't they see that? He, he, he admonished them. He said, if you won't believe the writings, you're not going to believe my words. And you know, there are so many people today. Of course, the Bible that a lot of people have is not really the Bible. I, I never, I still can't understand why people want a different version of what they call the Bible. I was sitting in the office of a pastor one day when we were traveling. He was from Ohio, and we'd gone there, be with him for a week. And uh, he had a friend that sat on the committee that did the New King James translation. And he, he posed a question to me. He said, couldn't there be an updated version? I said, why would you need one? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was very dumb back then, you know. I just thought, I just expressed myself, in, you know, the way I knew. You know, why do you need another one? I said, I've been reading that Bible since I got saved. I understand it. I don't fully grasp everything that's in it, but there are no words in there that I can't look up if I don't understand what they're saying. But he, uh, because it was his friend, he just thought that the New King James was all right. Of course, he didn't read it, I guess. He didn't see all the mistakes in it and all the places where they changed the scripture. But Jesus is saying to these Pharisees and these scribes, these teachers of the law, he's saying, why don't you believe what you read? Why don't you believe what you read? Search the scriptures. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 
He said, they're talking about me. The second witness, not only the witness of the writings, but the witness of his words, what he had to say. He told you, you read chapter number five. He made it very plain who he was, that he was the son of God, that God was his father. He made it very plain. And some of them came back with reports. One time the uh, temple guards were sent to take Jesus and they came back and reported, no man ever spake like this man. Another time they witnessed, he speaks with authority. He didn't speak like the scribes and the other teachers of the law. He didn't speak like they did. He spoke with authority. When he said, this is what it is, this is what it is. He didn't say, well, maybe. We have a lot of those kind of teachers today. But he said, if you don't believe the writings, you're not going to believe my words. But all we have to do is look at the scriptures and read them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read the words of Jesus. And he tells us who he is. I had somebody tell me one time, they said, well, Jesus never really said, I am the Son of God. He never really said that in the Bible. Oh, really? In uh, Mark, I forget what chapter it is, might be 15. Uh, the chief priest asked him, he said, are you the son of God? He said, I am. Now, isn't that saying that he is the son of God? Was his answer? He said, I am. He didn't go on to say, I am, but he just said, I am. And uh, people... I. You know who the Sadducees remind me of? They remind me of our higher critics. You know, the ones that started in Germany. And they want to take apart the word of God and explain. Uh, you were talking about Isaiah this morning. And uh, they want to divide Isaiah up into about five different things, you know. This is Isaiah, and this is somebody else, and this is somebody else, and this is somebody else. Because there's no way that Isaiah would know 140 years before it happened that the king's name was going to be Cyrus. What's the matter with those people? They don't know that God knows your name before you were born. He knows, he knows what you're going to do. He knows what you're going to think. Grasp a hold of this. At one time, all there was was God. Wrap your mind around that. Don't think on it too long, though. You go crazy. Yeah. I mean, all there was was God. There was no world. There was no universe, no stars. Nothing. Just God. And he can't do what he says he does. And he can't tell you 140 years before it happens what the guy's name's going to be. The thing I like about God is he said in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. He didn't make any explanation. He didn't say, 
and this is because. <laughs> and I was here because. It just says, in the beginning, God. Yeah, that's all there was. So he said, you're, you don't believe the witness of the writings. You don't believe the witness of my words. And you don't believe the witness of my wonders. John recorded seven miracles in his book. You think that's all that Jesus did? No, John says, I can't even write them all. I, we can't even write them. He said the, the universe wouldn't contain the books. Jesus did so many more miracles than what is written, what is recorded. He just did one. And it was right before their eyes. Yeah. Right before their eyes. What about the blind man that had been blind from birth? Mm -hmm. And they, <laughs> they said, uh, we need to check this out. Uh, bring in your parents. We want to know if this is the same guy. <laughs> and the parents said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Mm -hmm. What was the matter with him? Unbelief. Unbelief. If you don't believe that book, then you might as well just put it up on the shelf somewhere. If you don't believe everything that book says about Jesus, well, just forget it. Just leave. Don't bother coming back because you ain't getting anything. His wonders. Miracle after miracle, feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. You know what's amazing to me? After he fed the 5,000, they're out there gathered again with 4,000. And he said, feed them. You know what the disciples said? How? <laughs> How? All we have is seven loaves. Is there anything in there? Hello? When he spoke into their ear, did it echo? But he said, have them sit down. Set them down. And he did the same thing again. I preached the message one time, can he do it again? Can he do it again? Of course he can. He can do it. He could have done it several more times if he wanted to. Isn't it amazing? After he fed them, the 5,000, after he fed them, they came the next day and wanted to make him king. And he said, you don't really want me as king. You want me as the baker. That's what you want. You want food. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, she said, give me this water so I don't have to come here and draw from this well. She didn't understand. She did after a bit, but she didn't understand then. Right. And you know, it's the same thing with people today. How many people bang on the church door and say, I need this? I need this. Well, come on in and sit down and listen to the Word of God. I don't need that. I need this. I need money for my electric bill. I need food. But I don't need Jesus. Jesus did so many wonders. There was people that were confused and they said, uh, is this the 
reincarnation of John the Baptist. And they were confused about it, and they said, well, John did no miracles. And he didn't. But Jesus did. Over and over and over again. And it was for one purpose, to show who he was. To show who he was. Fourthly and last, we have the witness of his walk. He did no sin. What did Pilate witness when the Jews, the high priest, and those brought Jesus to Pilate? He said, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. And even the witnesses against him couldn't agree. Finally, they said, well, he said that destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Well, he wasn't talking about the temple made out of stone. He was talking about himself. And he did exactly what he said he would do. friend of ours wrote a song. He'll do what he said he'll do. And he will. No man ever walked the earth that was sinless except him. Except him. There was no fault that they could find in what he did. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my example. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is the one I'm looking for. You know, the older you get, the more you look for that day, I think. Anyway, I do. If I never got to Kentucky, that'd be all right. That'd be fine. If Jesus wanted to come today, that'd be great. Get out of this misery. I don't want you to think I'm miserable all the time. I'm talking about the world that we live in. That's miserable. But you know, Jesus' world was miserable too when he came. We don't have any different problems than they had in their day. They're all the same. The devil doesn't tempt any different now than he did then. Still the same. The devil still has his group that are still fighting against what Jesus wants. Most of them are called senators and representatives and governors, presidents. Talking to Brother Barnes this morning, I said, I'm old, I can say what I want. I can just blame it on being old. (laughs) But I got five children. I got 30 grandchildren. I got five great-grandchildren. And I want them to have what I got. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's our hope. That's our hope. That's our hope for our relatives. That's our hope for our young people.
follow Christ. Pilate made a statement when he was talking with Jesus. And and when I when I read that, it was just mind boggling to me. He said, What is truth? What did Jesus say? I am the truth. And that's the only truth there is. Jesus Christ. He's the truth. The way and the life. I am glad that 51 years ago now, got saved in 71, didn't I? Or 70. I can't even remember anymore. When was Steve born? 70. I got saved in 71. May the 27th, 1971. I am glad that I realized the truth those many years ago. And I'm not going to let the ball slip now. There's a song that goes, I've come too far to look back. I don't really like that song. I'll tell you why. I don't even think about looking back. I don't even think about it. What's back there? What did I have before salvation? Misery. I had an ambition. I told people before, Brother Barnes, my, uh, when I got saved, my biggest concern was whether I was going to put an in-ground or above-ground pool in my backyard. That was my biggest concern. After I got saved, I never even got a pool. <laughs> I didn't care. Jesus Christ has been my life since I've been saved. I don't like it when people talk down about Christ. I have threatened before in my younger days to do something about it. I never did. I never got violent. I wanted to. Remember going with my pastor right after I first got saved. I went with my pastor and we were out door knocking and went to this guy's house and he invited us in. We sat down on the couch and was talking to him about the Lord. And he said something very derogatory about the Lord. I jumped up off the couch and I went right over to him with my hands clenched. And I said, you can't say that about my Lord. And my pastor jumped up right after me and grabbed a hold of me and said, Steve, this is his house. He can say what he wants to say. Okay. I remember going to Bible college and coming home the first after the first semester, been there one semester. And I came home and I wanted to go out on the street corners This was in 1971 or 72. I wanted to go out on the street corners and find every hippie I could, set on him, cut his hair, and witness to him while I was doing it. (laughs) But I didn't do that either. But you know what? People that don't know Christ are just like what I was when I didn't know Christ. They just don't know. They don't know. And they need compassion, not cruelty. They need someone that cares. 
And that someone is Jesus Christ. That's why he went to the cross. And they need someone that will tell them what Jesus did for them. And that's our job. That's our job. And it's not going to be well received a lot of times. It wasn't well received in Jesus' day. I mean, Jesus was standing right there before him. He said, I am the way. He was telling that to Thomas, old doubting Thomas. <laughs> but you know, when they went to uh, Bethany, when uh, Lazarus died, and he said, let's go to him. Thomas was the one that said, let's go with him. Let us die with him. He thought they were going to die. So he wasn't doubting then. God has given us a gift. That gift is Jesus Christ. And we are to be a witness for him, not just a testimony, but a witness. We need to tell them what Jesus can do for them. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time that you had allowed me to stand behind this pulpit. Thank you for the witness of the writings, for the witness of Jesus' words, for the witness of his wonders, and the witness of his walk. Thank you, Father, that we have seen this and we've embraced it. Help us to be a witness with our words that others might see it also and be saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.